Season's greetings, and welcome to a special series from Strangers and Aliens. For the weeks of Advent, we are taking a look at the traditional five candles of Advent. Um, traditional, but also imaginary candles. Again, I don't have the wreath, I don't have the candles. Uh, I'm Ben, Ben Avery, one of the hosts of Strangers and Aliens. Strangers and Aliens is a podcast about pop culture and Christianity. And in this podcast, we often talk about how um, fiction engages the imagination and also, as a result, engages the spirit. And so as we talk about the meaning of this fourth Advent candle this episode, we're going to mix in some personal experiences and also talk about some sci-fi, specifically Star Wars. In some Advent traditions, this fourth candle is It's called the peace candle. It's also known as the angel candle because of the message of peace that the angels spoke to the shepherds on that night when Christ was born. Leading up to this week, there's been a a progression from hope, the belief and anticipation that something will happen to faith, a strong trust in someone to joy which is a spiritual happiness that is much, much more than just feeling happy, but is a reaction to life with Christ, a reaction to the effects of placing your hope and your faith in God. So thinking about peace, this is another fruit in our lives, like joy was. Hope and faith, to me, are directions that we choose to point our heart in. Joy and peace are locations where we choose to park our heart. Peace is a prevalent theme at Christmas time, and rightfully so. It's because of that message that the angels gave to the shepherds. A single angel, I like to think it was Gabriel, but he doesn't identify himself in in this part of the narrative, delivered the message of great joy that will be for all people. But after that, a host of angels, and in some translations I've read it as an army of comes before the shepherds, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor favor rests. Now, I do find it kind of humorous to talk about peace with the context of of Star Wars. And, And there are two things I like to think of when I think of peace and Star Wars. They both sort of spin into the greater point as we look at peace at Christmas time, and in our lives. First, when I think of peace in Star Wars, I think of how there are a couple different scenes in the movies where a moment of peace is allowed to happen in the midst of all the running, of all the faster and more intense. Star Wars deserves its place in the sci-fi pantheon of greatness because of the technological achievements and the world building and so on. But the movies also tell personal stories and allow the characters to have moments to stop and to breathe and to feel. So I think of the time when the Millennium Falcon and the first Star Wars as they're running from the Death Star or flying from the Death Star and Luke has time to process what happened to Obi-Wan There's that quiet moment there with him and Princess Leia. And in the quiet moment later in Return of the Jedi between him and Darth Vader as they're talking and getting ready to go on the elevator, the peace before the storm. But the greatest moment of peace in the uh, the movies, I think, is an incredible moment in The Empire Strikes Back when Han, Chewie, Leia, and 3PO escape the asteroid monster and find themselves flying right at the Star Destroyers and then disappear. Their ship, it's too small for a cloaking device, apparently, but... It's just the right size to allow them to disappear as they attach themselves to the back of Star Destroyer. And then when the Star Destroyer drops its garbage to make the jump to light speed, the Millennium Falcon just drops away and floats away, quote, with the rest of the garbage. Uh, Princess Leia says, you do have your moments. (laughs) Uh, Not many of them, but you do have them. And I just love that scene. It's just a great wonderful moment in the middle of a great film. It's a moment for the audience to stop and breathe in the midst of all the the action. And and it's also a moment for the characters to react and show more range, uh, making them more real. It's short, but it's peaceful. 
and meaningful. Now, for myself, when I think of peace, I think of one of the most peaceful moments I've ever experienced in my life. It was a particular snowy day. I was living in Michigan. I was in sixth grade, and I went outside to play by myself in the snow. I loved playing in the snow, and I just remember finding a snowdrift in our yard, and I started digging into it, and then I started nestling into it, and I laid down in the snowdrift on my back in just absolute stillness. It was so quiet. I could hear the snowflakes landing on the snow. This was possibly the most peaceful moment I've experienced in my life. This is what I think of when I think of peace, when I think of the definition of peace, that is. Um, But I think in the context of what we're talking about here, we need to do a little bit of redefining of the word. And I don't mean just that the angels were talking about bigger peace, peace on earth. I'm afraid that too often we miss the point when we put up our Christmas decorations that that proclaim peace, peace on earth and goodwill to men. Peace in this context is not just the absence of conflict. It's not just the absence of noise. It's not just the absence of chaos. Those things, they, they can figure into it, but the typical peace on earth with air quotes, that we talk about around Christmas is just a shadow of what I believe they were actually talking about. So let's face it, the world as it was when Christ was born into it was not a time, nor was it a place of peace. And today's world, even after the angel's proclamation and declaration of peace, is not a time, nor is it a place of peace. There's wars and rumors of wars all over. There's conflict everywhere. I can't help but think of the song, uh, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Eve, and, and the one verse that says, And in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The thing is, the angels did not proclaim an end to wars, or an end to violence, or an end to conflict. They did however, proclaim an end to a conflict. And the end of that specific conflict can and does and certainly could and should lead to the end of those other conflicts that we have and we experience in the world. If we let it, peace is more than a feeling and it's more than just a state of being. It's a starting point that does lead to those feelings. I'm not going to get into a King James version versus other versions of the Bible. But the King James translation, I think, misses the mark with, it's very poetic, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Uh, Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, that makes for a much better Christmas platitude, I think. Looks great on cards and on the wall in the mall. But as I look into the Greek translations, I'm not a Greek scholar. I like to say when I talk about biblical scholar, uh, whatever, whatever. I like to think that I I know enough to find the answers and ask the right questions. So anyway, the King James makes a promise in both of its phrases that there will be peace and goodwill to men, to people, to humans. But I see the way the original Greek wording, based on my unscholared study, is that the peace that's promised is conditional. It's not for all men or all people. It's for people with whom God is pleased or people on whom his favor rests. Almost all the newer translations put this caveat on the promised peace. Because the peace that is promised and proclaimed, yes, it is the end of a conflict, but it's not a conflict between humans and humans, wars, and that sort of thing. It's the end of a conflict between humans and God. The coming of Christ is the end of a conflict between humans and God. The peace they sang of belongs to those on whom God's favor rests. The peace they sang of is a personal peace with God. The peace comes from the restoration of a person's relationship with God. This peace comes from the forgiveness of sins that results from what Christ was born to do on the cross. As I said before, I do find humor in talking about peace and using Star Wars, a great big giant shoot 'em up pew pew. It's got the word war right there in the title, and most of the movies end in a giant explosion. (laughs) But looking closer, at the characters of the movie, and honestly, at anyone involved in in any kind of conflict and and, in any kind of story that has conflict. There are different reasons to have 
conflict and different reasons to engage in conflict. So some people, they fight for control and they fight for selfish reasons. Clearly, Palpatine and Snoke, they're examples of that. Their end goal, domination. Other people fight for peace. They fight to end the conflict. And they fight to shake that control. The rebellion, the resistance, the good guys. Both sides fight for a day when they do not need to fight anymore. Now, the difference is their motives. Their motives determine how they fight, and their motives determine what they hope for when the fighting ends and what they want to have for themselves when peace comes to the galaxy. So in the black and white conflicts of the Star Wars universe, there is some nuance, but not a lot. You have the bad guys fighting to take control and the good guys fighting to take back their freedom. And the peace we're talking about here is the end to a conflict between God and man. It's God himself creating a way to win the conflict we have because of sin. A two-front victory. On one front, he defeats sin itself for us. On the other front, he ends the conflict we have with him because of sin. That's peace on earth. And when that peace is a part of our lives, hopefully... The other conflicts find some peace as well, or at least how we respond to them is more peaceful. Having a growing and thriving relationship with Christ means we allow his fruit of the spirit to grow. Notice this metaphor of fruit does not mean, boom, I have them all fully formed and appearing in my life. They are fruit. They are tended to and nurtured and grown, and they are not our fruit. They are the Holy Spirit's fruit. They are divine in origin. So, as God's peace grows, we change, we grow. We handle our conflicts with others differently. We handle our conflicts with ourselves differently. With God, peace, peace outside us and peace within us, becomes less about control control of other people and control of external pressures and selfish control of ourself and more about freedom, freedom in Christ, which is freedom from the power of other people and from the external pressures and from that selfish control of ourself. So as we approach the end of this Advent season, think about peace. What is one of the most peaceful things you have ever experienced? What part of your life do you need peace in right now? I want to just tell you, start talking to God about that. Maybe it's a conflict with a friend. Maybe it's a conflict with an external pressure like, like money or expectations people have for you. Maybe it's a conflict within yourself something you can't let go of that you know you should or something that you should do that you just don't want to bring it to him let him help grow that peace that passes all understanding within you but don't stop him there <laughs> let his peace begin to envelop your life the angels glorified God in front of those shepherds, and what a moment that was. Think about what it was like to be there in those fields. Perhaps their peaceful night was interrupted by the light and noise of the angels. Now, think about the words. As the shepherds told their stories, these are the words that were remembered for us, for now. Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. It's a promise for them then, and a promise for us now. Where is that peace on earth they promised? It's personal peace with God that when we let it, grows into something much, much more. Thanks for spending time with me. Thanks for digging into the Christmas story and for reflecting on these special themes of Advent. There will be one more Advent reflection released on Christmas Eve. 
So if however you wish to listen, if you wish to listen to it, on, you can listen to it on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. And remember, you can find all these Advent episodes at strangersandaliens.com slash Advent. As usual, thanks for joining me. And until next time, Godspeed.